All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to the American Heart Association Southwest Southwest Affiliates webinar titled Stroke Essentials Beyond the PPA Window, What Else Can Be Done? The American Heart Association is proud to offer a quality a suite of quality improvement programs that can help you advance further and faster in your quest for better quality. For more information, visit our website. Let me go ahead and pull our slide up. Our website, www.heart.org slash quality. Today's webinar is the second in a series of offerings focusing on the essentials of stroke care. We will be calling upon experts in our Texas Primary and Comprehensive Stroke Centers to share their knowledge with professionals who are new to stroke or to professionals in smaller facilities where the staff handle time-critical diagnoses. We will be meeting the fourth Tuesday of each month from 12 to 1 p.m. If you have a topic you'd like to hear in this series, please let your local quality improvement director know. If you don't have a director or don't know his or her name, we will provide contacts at the end of today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. All phones have been placed on mute to cut down on background noise. To ask questions, press star 6 to unmute your line. Also, feel free to use the questions section of GoToMeeting to answer questions, to ask questions. All slides and handouts will be sent to attendees within one week of today's call. Also, please visit www.heart.org slash SWA quality to view the audio recording for today. At this time, I will turn it over to Shanti Raj, the Director of Quality and Systems Improvement, to introduce our speaker. Shanti? Thank you, Larissa. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. C. Benjamin Newman. Dr. Newman joined the Methodist Brain and Spine Institute in the summer of 2012 as the Director of Endovascular Neurosurgery. He is fellowship trained in endovascular neurosurgery from the Barrow Neurological Institute and also completed a full neurosurgery residency from UC San Diego. With his extensive and varied background in treating neurological conditions, he is able to evaluate the best treatment options for patients with a variety of cerebrovascular conditions, including stroke, aneurysms, tumors, and arterial venous malformations. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Newman. I will turn it over to you now to begin your presentation. Hi, this is uh, Ben Newman here. Thanks to Shanti and Larissa for all your help getting this uh, organized and for the last second kind of uh, stuff that we've been doing to get the uh, slide presentation all squared away. Um, at I'm a fellowship trained neurosurgeon from uh, University of California, San Diego, now down here in Dallas. I was recruited to be the Director of the uh, Neurovascular and Stroke Program here at the Methodist Dallas uh, Health System, which is a five hospital system in the DFW area. I'm going to be talking today about um, treatment of ischemic stroke and specifically what we can do kind of beyond uh, the uh, currently accepted and kind of uh, well deployed uh, intravenous uh, TPA treatment that we've done for systemic uh, thrombectomy and stroke. Um, please bear with me here. Uh, there seems to be a little bit of a delay from when I try and advance the slides and so forth, uh, so hopefully we'll get this going away. Um, I'm actually hitting the button now, and I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that it's moving here. Let me try a different, uh, different strategy. Yeah, it doesn't. Uh, you guys, was the control was passed over to me? Is that right? It doesn't look like um. Yeah. Yeah, I've hit I've hit a couple buttons. There we go. That looks like it was a little different. There you go. Okay, wonderful. All right. Hopefully, this won't jump forward three or four slides now. So just to kind of give you guys uh, an overview about what my my talk is going to be t uh, going over, and. Sorry, guys, this isn't, um, there we go. I'm going to be talking about ischemic stroke, a little bit of uh, historical perspective in terms of how we've been treating ischemic stroke over the last 20 to 30 years, talk a little bit briefly about medical therapy, intravenous TPA, systemic thrombolysis, uh, but again, the focus of this talk is really going to be what we can do after the TPA, quote-unquote, window is over and done with and what sorts of uh, stroke interventions and therapies we have offer us now. And I want to talk a little bit about building a stroke system because one of the um, 
one of the sort of tenets that's that's becoming deployed in our stroke community is uh, the fact that we really are going to probably eventually not be doing stroke interventions at absolutely every hospital, but trying to cultivate and establish referral patterns and relationships with outlying hospitals and centers like we have here at uh, Methodist Dallas where we can provide comprehensive stroke center and when we identify uh, patients that would benefit from from a higher level of care than getting those patients transferred um, over to, uh, to uh, a system uh, like ours. And I see that I see again. I see it's advanced, but for some reason there's a little bit of lag on my uh, on my end here. Just a second here. Um, I don't have any uh, disclosures. As one of my mentors likes to say, I have no disclosures, but I have lots of interests. I will be talking about the use of non-FDA approved uh, stroke treatments, uh, and I will um, uh, try and identify uh, when that happens. Let's just talk briefly. It's sort of I've got a couple of obligatory slides here. Uh, the definition of stroke. Um, again, this is stroke is sort of a, a layman's uh, term, uh, and it really comprises, uh, really falls under the umbrella of any sudden loss of oxygen delivery to a region of the brain. Most commonly, this is an ischemic stroke or a blockage of one of the uh, arteries. And there's a there's a graphic, an illustration off here to the right that kind of shows a middle cerebral artery occlusion, and that, that area that's kind of a dark pink is the territory that's at risk or the territory that's being supplied by that vessel that if uh, we don't uh, restore blood flow, then that could potentially become a stroke. Stroke also refers to aneurysms and AVMs. When you have bleeding inside the brain or an arterial rupture, you can have impaired ability to deliver oxygen to part of the brain served by that blood vessel as well. So that technically is a stroke, although less common. So about 15% of the time we're dealing with aneurysms, AVMs, basal ganglia hemorrhages, or, or uh, so forth. Again, I'm going to primarily be talking about ischemic stroke today. And probably the most common cause of ischemic stroke is either from atrial fibrillation, a clot forming inside the heart, and being projected into one of the brachiocephalic vessels and into the brain, uh, but occasionally we'll see it from uh, carotid artery stenosis, plaque forming at the origin of the carotid artery in the neck at the carotid bifurcation, or sometimes even due to intracranial atherosclerotic disease uh, inside the brain um, itself. But probably AFib and carotid stenosis are the most common uh, etiologies of uh, ischemic or thromboembolic stroke that we see. Waiting, waiting for my uh, slide to advance. Mm. <clears throat> so, neurosurgeons treating stroke. Um, this may seem a little bit uh, unusual to some of you. Typically, stroke is t uh, treated by neurologists, and it is true that a lot of stroke interventions, at least throughout the country, a lot of times it's radiologists or neurointerventional radiologists that are trained. So why is a neurosurgeon uh, interested in stroke? Well, for the hemorrhagic side of things, that may seem obvious. We've clipped aneurysms and resected vascular malformations in this country for many, many years. And for intraventricular uh, hemorrhages, we're the ones that do clot evacuation, ventriculostomy placement, CSF diversion, and manage ICPs uh, in the intensive care units. So for the hemorrhagic stroke, uh, it might seem pretty obvious uh, why that would happen. But why would a neurosurgeon be treating ischemic stroke? Well, a lot of the way that we've seen um, other fields evolve, cardiothoracic surgery was kind of had cardiology move into their territory a little bit when uh, coronary artery um, stenting and by and uh, and um, uh, uh, angioplasty came into play, and I'll sort of be drawing a lot of comparisons between neurosurgery, neurology, and cardiovascular and cardiology as it applies to stroke, because as I like to say. Neurosurgery and neurointerventional surgery is where cardiology was with regards to um, uh, heart attacks and STEMIs about 15 years ago. So we're playing catch up. Our technology has evolved to a point that's allowing us to do some things 
that we couldn't do 10 or 15 years ago. So we're trying to learn lessons from what the cardiologists went through and what they did and, and mirror that experience a little bit. Um, endovascular techniques were developed more or less simultaneously by neuroradiologists and by neurosurgeons. Serbinenko was probably the first one in the 1970s in Russia who was treating aneurysms by delivering detachable balloons into aneurysms rather than uh, doing surgical uh, clipping. And of course, like other fields, we started to gravitate towards these minimally invasive techniques for treating AVMs, aneurysms, and things like that. And it turns out that these techniques are directly applicable to ischemic stroke. So we go up to do an aneurysm coiling or embolize an arteriovenous malformation. We can use those same catheters and some of those same techniques that we learned to actually retrieve uh, clots inside the brain and uh, open up blood vessel, restore blood flow, and potentially reverse the effects of uh, an ischemic uh, stroke. So, of course, we began to learn some of these minimally invasive techniques, applied them to thrombectomy, re physical removal of the clot, or thrombolysis, injecting some sort of material to dissolve the clot. The end result, of course, trying to be to open up the blood vessel, restore blood flow, and... Um, our preserve function. And, uh, of course, uh, we feel that because of our training in neurocritical care, we're able to take care of the patient throughout their entire hospital stay from the time that they arrive in the emergency department in the angio suite to have their thrombectomy and in the neurointensive care unit while we manage them postoperatively. I don't need to tell the attendees of this webinar why ischemic stroke is so important and why we care about it, but here are some, here are some statistics to kind of underscore and emphasize why this is such an important topic. Again, 85% of strokes are ischemic, thromboembolic. Stroke is the leading cause of adult disability in the United States, and there are about 800,000 new strokes per year. About 5 million stroke survivors currently live in the United States, and we spend $50 billion dollars of uh, healthcare dollars um, tr uh, treating stroke, and the vast, vast majority of these dollars are treating patients that have a stroke and require long-term care afterwards because about 90% of stroke survivors will have some sort of deficit. So the vast majority of the money that we're spending on stroke is in long-term care facilities, skilled nursing facilities, and things like that because these people have severe strokes, not able to recover for them, not able to care for themselves, and so they basically require 24-7 um, uh, care and uh, especially as we're seeing stroke incidents increase in young people if a 40-year-old person has a devastating stroke and they live out the rest of their lives for the next 30 or 40 years in a nursing home, you can imagine that that is a uh, tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, health care um, expenditure uh, right there. And again, about one in six uh, uh, um, uh, stroke survivors will have uh, some sort of uh, go on to live with some sort of a deficit. In 1992, this is a list of all of the FDA-approved treatments or the positive trials that we had for all types of stroke. For ischemic stroke, there were none. Intracranial hemorrhage, none. For subarachnoid hemorrhage, we could give you nimodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and it would reduce the effect of delayed vasospasm or the irritation or clamping down of the blood vessels. And this was shown to have a very slight improvement in outcomes in patients in terms of their morbidity from vasospasm. And for uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, there really was wasn't um, anything that we could do. In 2012, just 20 years later, there's an extensive list of things that now became FDA approved. Um, in addition to giving IV TPA, which I'll talk about in more detail in just a minute, we now have uh, intraarterial thrombolysis. We have uh, mercy clot retrieval, and these are all different names of devices that we can use to remove clots subarachnoid hemorrhage, we've got improvements in neurocritical care, coil embolization, those sorts of things, and you can see that we've made a tremendous amount of progress. One of the mantras that we use in treating stroke is the golden hour, or as I like to say, time is brain, or time lost is brain lost. The, the, the Heart Association and the Stroke Association have done a really good public education campaign to remind people and start having people think about a heart attack, a, brain, a stroke as a brain attack, much in the way of the heart attack, because for every minute that a section of the brain is deprived of blood flow, you can see the statistics here. You lose 1.9 million neurons, 1 .4, 14 billion synapses, and about 7.5 miles of myelinated white matters. Th these numbers are, are, are totally staggering, and I don't think they're really we can really wrap our mind around it. But the idea here is that is that we have to we have to restore blood flow as quickly as possible because the longer that this goes on, the more likely it is that those deficits, those problems we're seeing as the stroke manifests 
will become permanent, and we, we want to try and intervene so that we can um, get that to happen. We have one of the concepts that we're talking about here is called the ischemic penumbra. So basically when uh, blood flow, when you have a stroke, you have a certain area, a certain section of the brain that is no longer rec receiving adequate blood flow. Sometimes that brain dies almost immediately, but there's a salvageable area of brain where the blood flow has decreased to a point where those neurons, those brain cells, don't have enough oxygen or energy to function normally, but they're not dead yet. So if we can intervene and we can go from the... Uh, this, is the this represents sort of the core area here. This is the stroke where this brain is already dead. No matter what we do, we're not going to be able to open it back up. But this brain here is salvageable. It's not getting enough blood flow right now. And if we can restore blood flow, successfully treat it, we can take it so that the stroke is very, very small here and hopefully uh, won't lead to uh, permanent uh, problems. But if it's untreated, then this, this ischemic area here eventually, as it's just barely getting enough blood flow so it's not dead yet but it can't function normally, over time it will progress to be a completed stroke. And then there, once that's done, there's really no... Um, there's really no uh, hope for us to intervene. So we talk about the core infarction, the area of the stroke where the brain is actually dead, but then we've got this penumbra, this area of brain that's salvageable where the restoration of the blood flow will result in recovery to these cells. In 1996, the FDA approved intravenous TPA, which is uh, stands for Tissue Plasminogen Activator. This is a um, uh, an enzyme which uh, takes a patient's uh, plasminogen and converts it into an active form, and this actually starts to break down clot. And we found that if we identified certain subgroups of patients and we gave a large dose of PA through the uh, veins, that we were actually able to help a significant number of people. So I have a graphic here which I really like. This, uh, these, these little um, silhouettes of uh, people right here represent 100 patients who come into the hospital with ischemic stroke. The original trial looked at stroke patients that were uh, found and identified within three hours of symptom onset, and if 100 of those patients got IV TPA, uh, 32 of these patients would do better, and in fact, the ones that are dark green here did significantly better. These patients in white had no change, no difference. And like everything we do in medicine, there's risk. And so these three patients down here, 3% of the patients would have uh, um, uh, complications or become worsened as a result of their treatment. And in fact, there would be one out of every 100 that would be severely disabled or maybe even uh, dead as a result of the treatment. The, the three-hour uh, margin and also the dose of uh, TPA that we uh, currently use was titrated very carefully to optimize this uh, this risk-benefit ratio. And again, the primary risk that we see is the risk of intracranial hemorrhage or, um, or, or causing that completed, that dead stroke um, uh, a brain to convert to a hemorrhage and you get bleeding inside the head. Uh, going back just a little bit, talking about some of the public uh, campaign awareness, this is a slide, this is a poster that we use here at Methodist Hospital to try and educate our providers, our nurses, and even our, um, uh, our, our patients, t telling them about the FAST acronym and trying to underscore the signs and symptoms of, uh, of stroke. Does the one side of the face droop from facial asymmetry? Do you have weakness and numbness in one of the arms or difficulty, clumsiness, and clumsiness on one side of the body? Is the speech slurred or a difficulty producing speech? And, of course, time is critical. Time is brain. We need to uh, have people um, pick up the phone, call 911, and get to the hospital as quickly as we can. I think one of the most unintentionally harmful things that people do is try and drive themselves or a loved one to the hospital, not realizing that stroke patients are very, very sick and their condition can change very, very quickly. Um, I also, since we have uh, some uh, physicians and nurses uh, on the uh, phone here, I kind of want to also talk a little bit about most of the time when we talk about stroke signs and symptoms, we're thinking about uh, anterior circulation, so middle cerebral artery, internal carotid artery collusions, inclusion, occlusions, which um, uh, lead to some of those symptoms that I just talked about. But don't forget about the posterior circulation. There's, there's strokes that can affect the brainstem and the cerebellum as well, and these uh, present typically a little bit differently. You can have patients that come in with ataxia, uh, diplopia. Here's a great example here of a cranial nerve palsy, disconjugate gauge, optia ophthalmoplegia. This patient here has a hypoglossal nerve injury from a, a stroke and she's got um, a deviation of the tongue. 
um, dysarthria, so maybe not aphasia, but uh, slurred speech or kind of uh, a difficulty with uh, producing the sounds of speech. Sometimes you'll have these patients come in that have waxing and waning symptoms. So if you see somebody that has symptoms like this or complaining of things like that, be thinking in the back of your mind that these could be crescendo TIAs. This individual could be having a posterior circulation stroke, which we, which we need to intervene on uh, as well. So some of the limitations of IVTPA, again, I don't want to go into too much um, laborious detail here, but there is a tight time window. So we have to get to these patients within three hours. And again, this was extended out to four and a half hours, um, uh, although that's not an FDA uh, approval, but uh, that's commonly used at many, many uh, primary stroke centers throughout the country. If a, if a patient presents within four and a half hours of symptom onset, they'll still get um, IVTPA. Um, the... I, I say the brain doesn't have a clock because we know that some patients can have ischemia of the brain for an hour and they'll have a completed infarction and no matter what we do, they'll never get any better. Some patients come in and will have stroke symptoms for 12 hours and if we open the blood vessel back up, they go back to normal. Now, the reason for that is something that we're trying to uh, learn more about as a, as a stroke community. It probably has something to do with collateral circula uh, circulation or the circle of Willis. So you can get um, uh, blood flow routed from uh, alternate areas, and we need to do a better job at identifying those patients that have good collateral circulation and might actually benefit from intervention outside of that four-and-a-half and eight-hour and 12-hour eight uh, window. So we want to move away from from just using the last known normal time and uh, having having a, uh, a criteria that's based on a clock because uh, I, I don't think that that's a good map. It's not a good analogy to what's actually going on inside the brain. IVTPA is also ineffective at recanalizing through large clots. So that that's sort of intuitive. If you've got a large amount of clot burden sitting inside of the carotid artery, for example, and you're giving drug through the vein and expecting it to circulate throughout the entire body, and have a sort of action at a distance far, far away, it stands to reason that the larger the clot is, you're going to need either a higher dose of, um, of TPA to break that up uh, or maybe some other intervention that's going to sort of address the problem more directly. Um, you have to give IV TPA continuously, so the, the drip usually runs in over a course of an hour or so, and this is because this is uh, this is a, an enzyme that's uh, cleared very quickly by uh, by the liver. There's actually some animal models uh, that have shown that uh, the TPA that we use can actually be neurotoxic, so it might be effective at breaking down a small clot, uh, but if that same drug is also making the uh, potentially vulnerable tissue inside the brain more likely to die or become injured, then this is not a good choice. Uh, for uh, for a drug for us for stroke treatment. And, of course, there's a whole variety, a whole list of exclusion criteria for patients that can't get IVTPA. So they come to the hospital, they have a stroke diagnosis, they go through all the correct um, uh, screening procedures and so forth, and you find out that they've got a platelet count less than 100,000 or they uh, had a uh, hysterectomy a month ago or something along those lines. So you can see here that there's a, a large number of people that would be excluded from receiving IV TPA, which is class one evidence-based therapy for stroke, but they can't get it because they have contraindications. Again, you've got a thrombolytic agent circulating throughout the entire body, so the, the possibility for distant side effects, bleeding inside the abdomen, um, uh, anything along those lines um, that that could uh, potentially cause a problem for you. So, you know, IV TPA is a good drug, but we need to get better at uh, dealing with patients who have um, very large clot burden, who are outside the time window, or who potentially have other exclusion criteria. The NIH stroke scale is a standardized uh, test that we use that is very, very useful in communicating information to other healthcare providers uh, for measuring stroke severity. This is a this is a test. This is an exam that you don't want to score well on because if you get a high score on the NIH stroke scale, you have a more severe stroke. So the NIH stroke scale measures stroke severity. Zero is perfect. Forty-two is basically moribund, um, uh, comatose, completely obtunded and unresponsive. And we typically say that an NIH stroke scale of greater than 15 is a severe stroke, that's not a rehabable lesion. If somebody comes in and they've got an NIH stroke scale of 15 uh, due to a stroke, 
that patient is very, very likely, unless they get some sort of intervention, they're very, very likely to go on to uh, require uh, significant care uh, down the road. Um, we are getting a little bit better in terms of the systemic thrombolytic agents that we can use. Recently, there was a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Actually, I guess it's been about two years ago now, looking at a, a, an alternative, a slightly different form of a, a genetically engineered mutant tissue plasminogen activator. This is not degraded by the liver nearly as quickly. It has some advantages in terms of its deliverability. This study done here was actually done all the way out to symptom onset within 60 um, 16, uh, six hours, excuse me. Down here at the bottom, we're talking about, you'll see here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this word periodically, this hemispheric perfusion lesion. So this is uh, using a CT scan with a specifically timed dose of uh, IV contrast that allows us to look at um, blood delivery to the brain. So if we see that there is, uh, um, we, we basically can quantify the degree of, uh, of uh, perfusion and compare that to what we think is the actual uh, completed infarction. So this gives us an idea of actually trying to measure that ischemic penumbra. There, there are some problems with CT perfusion, and I'll talk a little bit more later about why that hasn't um, gotten more widespread uh, adoption. Uh, but basically, when we looked at the uh, the studies here, it seemed to be pretty... Um, seem to be pretty promising. The primary uh, outcome measures for this study uh, were the perfusion volume or sort of a radiographic analysis of how effective the thrombolysis was, looking at changes in the NIH stroke scale. And really, the thing that I like to focus on the most is, is what are these patients like three months down the road? It's great if we can open up a blood vessel. It's great if we can do all these neat things. But really, at the end of the day, what we're talking about is getting people either back to work or back home uh, so that they can carry on with their lives and they're not requiring a tremendous amount of treatment. And in fact, in all of these, both primary and secondary measures, there was a significant improvement seen in um, tenecteplase versus alteplase. This is still investigational. The use is still limited to clinical trials. Work is ongoing here, but I wanted to give you a glimpse of potentially down the road. We are making some improvements, uh, improvements here. But so what are we doing now when, um, you know, I, I've, I've talked a little bit about, um, you know, some of the problems that we have, and I want to kind of focus on people with severe strokes and have large vessel occlusions. And when I say large vessel, I mean internal carotid artery, vertebral artery, basilar artery, or middle cerebral artery. These are, these are very, very large um, Comparatively speaking, uh, clots that cause uh, that when when these blood vessels, blood vessels get occluded, we know that the recanalization rate for IV TPA is poor when you're talking about high clot burdens. It's only about 30 percent for patients that have middle cerebral artery occlusion. So when we have somebody that has a severe stroke, an NIH a significant NIH stroke scale of greater than 10. Uh, for example, I'll just give you this. Uh, this 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 uh, infer this um, was just presented at the uh, at the uh, neurosurgery cardiovascular section meeting. Uh, the, the recent uh, experience with opening acute carotid occlusions. If you have an a carotid an acute carotid occlusion with an NIH stroke scale of greater than 10, which technically is a moderate stroke, you have a zero percent probability of a good modified Rankin scale of zero to two at six months. So. We need to get better at treating patients with severe strokes due to large vessel occlusions because right now we don't have any treatments that work for them in terms of um, IV TPA or systemic thrombolysis, and uh, these patients do not improve with rehabilitation. So now we're going to move outside of the TPA window. So these are patients that come in outside of the four and a half hours, or they have some of those contraindications that I uh, talked about which would prevent them from getting uh, systemically um, uh, thrombolyzed. Um, at our institution, we activate stroke codes all the way out to 12 hours. Now, the, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the mechanical thrombectomy devices. For the most part right now, um, our intervention is limited uh, to about eight hours. The FDA has uh, approved mechanical thrombectomy for for uh, emergency stroke treatment all the way up to uh, eight hours. But we activate to 12 hours because, you know, one of the most common um, presentations of uh, stroke is, is the wake-up stroke. And so an individual goes to bed at... 
uh, 9 o'clock, and they come into the hospital the next morning, and they're found at 5 o'clock, and they've got symptoms of a stroke. They get to the emergency department, so now it's 7 o'clock. So it's 10 hours since they were last seen normal. That looks and feels and sounds like somebody who's unfortunately probably not going to be a candidate for um stroke intervention because we know that if we if if it is the case that the stroke has been there for truly 10 hours by opening that blood vessel we may actually do more harm than good by opening a full pressure head of arterial blood flow into a completed stroke bed but it is very very common for us to go down the pathway of working up the stroke and if we don't activate the code stroke then we miss out on the opportunity when the patient's wife comes in and says, you know, he got up at 3 o'clock in the morning and used uh, the restroom. So we know that he was ambulatory at that point. That instantly changes the dynamic very, very quickly. Now this is somebody who, rather than being 10 hours out from their stroke, is 4 hours out from their stroke. And maybe we've missed their IVTPA window, but we're still within that 8-hour window. And so we can, we've already mobilized and already drawn the appropriate lab, started our IV, obtain the appropriate imaging so that we can go directly to the cath lab and potentially uh, make a huge impact on this individual's um, quality of life and stroke outcome. Initially, what we did was we started with intra-arterial thrombolysis. And so, obviously, this is, again, a sort of an intuitive thing. If you're delivering the uh, thrombolytic agent uh, immediately adjacent to wherever this clot is, you can use a lower dose, you get directly delivery to the clot, and in theory, the systemic side effects should be less. In the first uh, case, the first um, study that was uh, was done uh, back in the 90s was using prourokinase, and uh, this had a modified Rankin, significant improvement in modified Rankin scale for um, a 40% versus 25% of uh, people. This was before... Um, IVTPA had been uh, uh, class 1 therapy, so the control group was just getting uh, heparinization. You can see that the recanalization rate was 66%, so even, even IVTPA is, uh, is not that good. And there was no difference in mortality. What we did see is that there was a very slight increase in this SIH. This, this is the symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. So again, this idea that the, the brain is dead. We open up the blood flow to try and preserve that ischemic penumbra, but the blood-brain barrier has been disrupted in the area of the brain that is uh, was uh, affected by the stroke, and we actually can cause that to convert to uh, hemorrhage. So there was a slight increase in symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage. In other words, the patients who received intra arterial uh, thrombolysis um, had a neurological decline that didn't cause them to uh, die, but it, it, it caused a worsening of their NIH stroke scale. But even so, this, uh, these data supported the idea that um, IA thrombolysis did have fewer side effects and could result in improved uh, patient outcome. In 2004, uh, the FDA approved for the first time the use of a mechanical thrombectomy device, and I've got it over here on the left, and this was called the Mercy device. And the way that this worked, again, the blood is flowing from left to right on your screen, and this is the clot that's... Uh, that's uh, sitting here, and so you would advance uh, a microcatheter, and this is almost always done through femoral arterial access. We establish the femoral artery, uh, go all the way up with our guide catheter, obtain ipsilateral control of the internal carotid artery, and then under biplanar fluoroscopic visualization, advance a microcatheter, a microwire through the clot. This microcatheter goes through the clot, and then as we unsheath the microcatheter, this wire resumes a sort of its normal corkscrew shape, so it has a lot of uh, memory in it. The idea is we hope that this corkscrew then in interdigitates with the clot, you inflate a balloon catheter to arrest flow, and then you pull the clot hopefully back into the uh, guide catheter. This device was revolutionary in 2004. It uh, resulted in 70% recanalization rate of the middle cerebral artery and internal carotid artery, which was more than double what we expected to see with uh, intravenous uh, or systemic thrombolysis. Three years later, uh, competitor Penumbra uh, uh, created a device, and so this is a little bit different. Again, you need a large bore catheter that goes all the way up to the clot face. 
But this uh, tube here, you actually hook up to a uh, suction device or a vacuum pump. And so this is actually reversing flow, sucking it into the vacuum pump. And hopefully you have this little separator right here, which is kind of like a rotor rooter device. You pass it in and out. It breaks up the clot, and uh, hopefully you suck out the clot as well. And this uh, was sort of an incremental improvement here. We went from 70% recanalization rate to 80% recanalization rate. So even in 2007, we'd already established significant improvements in our technological ability to open blood vessels. Uh, now the current generation, these, we're sort of up to our third generation of mechanical thrombectomy devices, and these are the so-called stent trievers. And the reason for that is they look and feel a lot like coronary artery stents and some of the stents that we actually put intracranially inside the brain as well. But they don't detach. We don't leave stents inside the brain. Instead, we deploy this stent, which is the first part of the, the sort of the portmanteau there. The second part of it, the trever, is that we actually then, once this stent is, that once this device is inserted, interdigitated into the clot, we pull it back into the catheter, and this does a really, really nice job of recanalization all the way up to 85, and we're even seeing higher rates than that now. The nice part about this is that you're not passing that wire in and out like you were with the penumbra device, and so the risk of vessel perforation was uh, was significantly lower. So this is this is really where we've moved as a field, and since 2011, we've used this uh, solitaire device. And there are a number of competitors um, out there which uh, basically offer the same thing. I have a short video here which I'd like to play, which is uh, just going to sort of give a, a quick animation of uh, of what the uh, stent retriever is uh, is like. And one of the things I like about stent retrievers as well is before we actually go up and um, and perform the thrombectomy and, and actually remove it, when we open that stent, we can restore blood flow immediately and get some flow to that for that tissue that has been deprived of uh, of blood flow and sort of reset the clock, or at least that's the uh, that's the thinking. Because while there can be some uh, delay in the ability to actually remove the clot. Once that stent is opened, it kind of creates a channel through the clot, and blood flow can begin to to go uh, normally into the brain. Um, so I am. Uh, I don't know. It looks like the video is starting to play, although it looks like there's a pretty significant amount of lag on my end, unfortunately. Well, my again, my hope was that I would be able to sort of narrate what that was happening with the animation, but I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Again, we go up with the microcatheter, deliver the stent retriever device into the clot itself. That allows blood flow to begin performing through, and then when we pull that device back, hopefully the stent retriever has grabbed onto enough of the clot that we're able to pull it out. So really now we've gotten to a point where Technically, it's easy for us to open a blood vessel. I can I can almost always, uh, you know, more than 80, 90 percent of the time, I can go in and open up a blood vessel. But the issue that we're running into is identifying the patients that would benefit from having this. So we'll uh, continue on after the year. Let's see here. One of the things that we've uh, seen, though, and we know this, is that improving the time to opening the blood vessel or time to recanalization, the faster we can recanalize, the faster that we can open the blood vessel and restore high-quality flow, that tends to be improved, tends to be correlated with uh, improved patient outcomes. But I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the, the trials that came out last year that, that actually showed, or at least appeared to show, uh, that this may not be the uh, that may not be the case. So in uh, 2013, the New England Journal of Medicine published three "quote unquote" negative trials for thrombectomy. These were presented at the International Stroke Conference, and they received a lot of press because the a lot of hospital administrators and even the federal government interpreted these studies to say, well thrombectomy doesn't work, you shouldn't be doing these procedures because uh, it's not any better than IVTPA. And I, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, some problems that we uh, had with that, um, with that study and, and why I think that you need to be a little bit careful about interpreting the uh, results. So IMS3 was the, um, IMS3 was the first 
study here. Let me just see. I think I might want to make sure that the uh, slides don't seem to be advancing. Let me, can we double check and make sure that control was passed back over to me here? Oh, there we go. Okay, it's coming along. Thanks for your patience. In uh, IMS3 was the first and probably largest study that received a lot of the uh, attention. This was a direct comparison between intravenous uh, TPA uh, versus intravenous TPA plus a thrombectomy or simply getting intraarterial TPA. Patients enrolled in this study had to present within three hours. They were randomized in a two-to-one ratio for intervention. And this was prematurely terminated by the safety board for the reason being that the modified Rankin scale of uh, of um, two or less was uh, the same in both groups. So there was no difference in outcome, no difference in bleeding, and no difference in mortality, basically failing to demonstrate superiority of intervention. Well, there were some problems right off the bat with this. First of all, this study was published in 2013. I think it was stopped in 2010 or 2011. It took a very, very long time to enroll enough patients to uh, to to do this. So, the uh, the technology that we were using was 2006 era technology, and we've 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 already gone um, two generations beyond that. There also was a significant use of thrombectomy outside the trial, so patients would show up at stroke centers that were supposed to be enrolling patients in IMS3. The interventionalist would say, you could be enrolled in this, but what you really need is a thrombectomy, and I'm going to go ahead and take that out. So they were kind of cherry-picking the cases that that were going to go really, really well, which was part of the reason, again, why it took so long to accrue patients. Interestingly, um, patients who did not require a CT angiogram if they had a severe stroke. So if their NIH stroke scale was greater than 10, they could be randomized and entered into the trial, which we would never do that now. You would We would never take a patient to angio suite if they didn't have a CT angiogram or some other high, high, high index of suspicion that they had um, a large vessel occlusion. So only 47% of the patients that were enrolled had a CT angiogram, and that led to 20% of the people who were enrolled in the intervention arm had no thrombus or they had a clot that was inaccessible. So you already have a significant amount of people with no large vessel occlusion who were enrolled in the intervention arm. And, of course, they were using outdated technology, so they were using a uh, Mercy device, which um, only 40% of the patients had uh, TICI, which is uh, kind of like the TIMI flow. A TICI flow of 3 is normal blood flow following intervention, and TICI B means uh, greater than 50% of the vessels, downstream vessels, are open. So only 40% got good flow, which we routinely see 68% are stent trevers, and so uh, these results should be interpreted uh, very cautiously. MR Rescue is another one. Again, uh, they were using Mercy and Penumbra devices. Uh, they tried to incorporate some of the non-invasive perfusion imaging, CT perfusion, MRI perfusion, to try and identify patients that had a penumbral pattern. Um, and so, interesting, what they noticed here is that patients that had good flow, either 2B or 3, and so 1 is basically no flow, 2A is less than 50%, 2B is greater than 50%, 3 is normal flow. If you can restore good flow to patients that have large vessel occlusions, they actually did better. And this came out in some subgroup analysis. Uh, but again, only 27% of patients had, uh, had 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 a good flow. So again, we see 68% with our modern stent trevers. These patients did not have good recanalization. They didn't have good uh, blood flow. And in fact, the revascularization rates were lower in the interventional arm than they were in the control arm patients like IVTPA. So that, right off the bat, should raise some serious flags that there were some problems with the with the uh, technique used in the study. Um, and again, uh, favorable penumbra patterns. So they were using MR perfusion, and they thought they'd figured out a way to identify patients that had a salvageable penumbra. These patients did better, regardless of whether or not they get intervention. So these are the patients that we actually want to try and identify, the ones with salvageable brain. I'll talk a little bit about that just um, a little bit. And then finally, uh, synthesis was the uh, last trial, and this is an Italian study that... Um, uh, again, looked at uh, intraarterial therapy versus IVTPA. 
No difference in modified rank and scale outcome at three months. Again, no difference in mortality, no difference in bleeding rates, but also no difference in outcome. So really, what can we learn about and I'm going to kind of skip back. I don't want to belabor this too much. But really, what is it that we can learn from these trials then if there's no difference between stroke intervention, excuse me, uh, IVTPA and intraarterial thrombolysis? Well, again, we need to interpret these results very carefully because um, actually there were some encouraging things that were uh, identified. Th that We uh, confirmed the uh, safety profile of these uh, treatments. Just because they de they failed to demonstrate superiority, they actually uh, showed us uh, that there were no difference in bleeding and no difference in complication rates from stroke treatments. And subgroup analysis in the IMS3 showed that patients who had very severe strokes with an NIH stroke scale of greater than 20, they actually do benefit more from intervention. They had modified rank and scale of two or less in 24% of the time versus 17% with the IVTPA. Now, this wasn't statistically significant, but I talked a little bit already about some of the problems in IMS3 in terms of the randomization. So what we do know is that by subgroup analysis, patients with large vessel occlusion, high NIH stroke scale, do better with a rapid restoration of high quality flow. Just a second here. So I want to talk a little bit about what cardiology has been able to do. It's, it's, it's very common. Cardiology, again, has had a 15 to 20 year head start on us in uh, stroke treatments in terms of uh, uh, refining their workflows and patient identification and things like that. The uh, typical workflow for a suspected MI looks uh, something like Hang on, I'm, I'm really behind on my slide. I have no idea what you guys are uh, seeing right now. Let's just give me a second here to kind of uh, make sure that we're all caught up. You're on the understanding the negative stroke trials is the slide that we're... Yeah, and, I'm, and I've, I've hit the uh, button a few times to try and go. I need to go to slide uh, number 40, which is starts where we need to go. Oh, I think I think it might be one more one more in front of that. There we go. Well, I'll just say this was this is sort of a little tongue in cheek response, but basically what we can learn from the thrombectomy trials, outdated technology used in poorly selected patients is not effective in treating stroke. Uh, we need to be very careful, though, because the federal government is looking very carefully at us, and I think we've got one more shot to demonstrate superiority of um, of uh, thrombectomy, and we're working as a specialty to try and uh, make sure that that study is done and done effectively so we can continue to deliver what I believe is the most effective and safest way to treat uh, patients with severe strokes and large vessel occlusion. In cardiology, when someone has a suspected MI, the first thing that happens is they get an EKG, and usually simultaneously to that, they're getting an IV access so that they can get a troponin drop. With these two, you've got a physiological study here, an EKG, which shows you myocardial ischemia. You have troponin, a biomarker that's showing you uh, cell death, and those patients go to the cath lab. Typically, we see minutes, which is just outstanding when you when you when you think about all that goes into uh, managing these incredibly sick patients. So, in stroke treatment. Right now, uh, we typically see door-to-needle times that are 90. If you can consistently hit door-to-needle times of 90 minutes, that's just outstanding. and we, that, that is uh, achievable and uh, able to be accomplished, although really only at uh, centers that uh, do this thing very, very regularly and have um, refined their workflows very, very well. Um, some of the problems that we currently have right now is we don't have a biomarker for the brain. So there's no troponin equivalent that helps us identify when we have brain ischemia, when we have salvageable brain, or trying to quantify how much brain is actually dead by some sort of biological marker. Um, we're, we're still working on that. There's been some microfractional uh, assay analysis that's uh, coming 
uh, down the pipe that's been uh, very promising, but this is still in the lab and we're not even, uh, there's no clinical trials that I know of that are currently ongoing right now for uh, for this. And we don't have a, a reliable physiological study to help us uh, stratify these patients. So we're looking at CT and MRI perfusion. Again, as I alluded to, this is basically either a CT or an MRI scan with a specifically timed bolus of contrast that radiologists can then interpret with some software that helps us identify brain that's already dead versus brain that's still receiving blood flow, although maybe at a rate that won't prevent it um, from functioning, but maybe is not uh, dead yet. The problem is that this tends to be very, very difficult to deploy across multiple sites. So you end up having to tailor your protocols for one individual institution. It's very, very dependent on the technologist that's administering the contrast, that's uh, performing the CT scans, and that's choosing uh, how to interpret the, basically the way that you set your windows and things like that for the software. So the cross-site reproducibility is very, very poor. Um, and we're using the last known normal time. Again, the brain doesn't have a clock. We need a better physiological study that helps us identify um, salvageable brain rather than just looking at uh, anatomical uh, imaging like CT angiogram and CT scan. One of the things we do know from, uh, from also from the New England Journal negative trials is that um, uh, imaging of the arterial tree via a CT angiogram is critical in identifying patients that could benefit from stroke intervention. So at our hospital, we do a CT scan of the head, which is part of the protocol for working up um, uh, ischemic stroke patients to receive IVTPA, but they also get a CT angiogram of the head of the neck because if we see a large vessel occlusion, carotid artery occlusion on the CT angiogram, those patients will get IVTPA, but we're going to go ahead and call the interventionalist at the same time and say, hey, this patient uh, has a large vessel occlusion and a very low likelihood of improving. You might want to start evaluating them and, and mobilizing your team. Of course, if they clinically improve, then we usually don't do the intervention, but it's better to have initiated that process than rather waste another hour uh, during the golden hour trying to mobilize our team. We need to get better at finding our protocols, identifying stroke patients, getting them to the cath lab more quickly. Door to needle times right now are hovering in the 120 minute range on average throughout the country. Our next goal is gonna to be to get that down to 90 minutes and I would like to see it at 45 minutes eventually and that might require uh, working with our partners and paramedics and EMTs to do field activations for stroke codes and, and maybe we'll get to a, a place down the road where we can actually initiate some stroke treatment. Um, in the uh, in the ambulance, but again, we're we're still far away from that, and we need faster, better recanalization. We're going to continue to improve our our stroke treatment devices. So whatever the next generation from stent retrievers is going to be, that's going to be our improve our recanalization rate with well, while keeping our complication rate of bleeding inside the head uh, as low as we possibly can. I want to talk a little bit before I see I've got about six or seven minutes left in the talk. Um, I want to talk about building stroke systems because really treating stroke is a team effort. And the fact of the matter is, is that an interventionalist, a neurosurgeon like me, only a small minority of strokes that we see are going to be candidates no matter what for any sort of an intervention. I rely to do my job on a huge number of people. We have an excellent stroke coordinator here at a Methodist Hospital, Crystal Ramirez, has done a great job in uh, making sure that uh, our nurses and our respiratory technologists and our interventional radiology technologists and our emergency room doctors, neurologists, critical care doctors, pharmacy, all these people need to come together together to deliver uh, really uh, excellent uh, care in these incredibly sick patients. But also, we have to cultivate referral patterns. We have to cultivate relationships with outlying hospitals because the fact of the matter is, is it's expensive to, to, to run a stroke program, and it's not realistic. It's not um, feasible for uh, most rural hospitals to be able to build a stroke program, to have an interventional team that's on call 24-7 with a 30-minute response time and to have and recruit neuroradiologists and those sorts of things. And, and most strokes don't require emergency intervention. So what we need to do is is figure out how do we have these relationships where a potential stroke patient shows up at a rural hospital, they're evaluated and screened, and they get their IVTPA, but then what if they need more? What's the best way to facilitate that? So building this stroke and hub uh, model and building um, – uh, regional stroke resources. And I think the first most important thing is to understand and know where the comprehensive stroke 
centers are in your region, in your community. Now, there's a, the the JCO and sort of Joint Commission accreditation is is moving forward, and I think more and more hospitals will go forward um, with that. But that's step number one: figuring out where am I going to send my stroke patients, and uh, and, and and creating these regional stroke networks. Um, you know, we are in the area of the, uh, of the Internet now, and telepresence, teleradiology, teleneurology has gotten uh, more and more commonplace. And we actually employ teleneurology here at our hospital from time to time. So we have, if a stroke uh, code gets activated, we have a, uh, a, a company that provides uh, computers where this computer is wheeled into the uh, into the examination room. A neurologist is there on a computer screen with a high quality microphone, high quality digital camera, directing the nurse to perform an examination. They can do a a pretty good uh, neurological examination from over the internet. They're able to review the images, and these neurologists can help emergency room uh, doctors uh, uh, decide what the next best appropriate treatment or imaging modality is uh, going to be. You've got the opportunity for phone and internet consultation with either the neurologist or even an interventionalist if you're at a hospital that has that sort of a relationship. Pick up the phone, call your interventional radiologist, call your interventional neurosurgeon and figure that out. Uh, the drip and ship, of course, most patients that receive IVTPA will get better, don't need to be transferred out. But again, if you identify a patient that has a large vessel occlusion, probably not going to benefit from IVTPA with a severe stroke, you should initiate class 1 treatment, initiate IVTPA, but then try and get that patient to a comprehensive stroke center as quickly as you possibly can. Um, at uh, This is in 2013. This is kind of what uh, our, our stroke program here at Methodist Hospital, our cerebrovascular, comprehensive cerebrovascular coverage has been up and running for about a year now. So in 2013, this is just a little graphic that I put together that kind of indicated what our coverage area is. And because, of course, the vast majority of our strokes are going to come from right here in the DFW area, but we've gotten a number even from across the border in Oklahoma, uh, Wichita Falls, Nagadoches, and we're sort of uh, trying to uh, make it easy and uh, facilitate uh, outlying hospitals to uh, transfer patients into us if they have any concerns about that might potentially need a higher level of care. And of course, our our job is to do whatever is in the best interest of the patient. If we don't think that we have anything to offer and they're not going to benefit from treatment, we we'll frequently um, recommend that those patients uh, stay in their current hospital and we'll continue to provide support um, as best we can. Um, uh, so that's sort of my uh, conclusion of my talk right there. Strokes are very, very common. They're a serious and common cause of morbidity. Most of the money that we spend is spent on rehabilitation, so we need to intervene in these patients very, very quickly, try to restore blood flow, try and improve outcome, try to reverse the effects of the stroke before they come permanent, try and salvage that ischemic penumbra, work really closely with our partners in rural hospitals and community hospitals, facilitate relationships, facilitate transfers, and create these regional stroke networks, employ some of these newer stroke treatments that we can use that will significantly improve patient outcomes, and, and remember that this is medicine is a team sport, and uh, we, we rely on each other. We rely on, I, I rely on rural community hospitals to call me and send me patients, and, and um, you know, there, it's a, it's a two-way street, and I think that, that is going to be sort of the mantra uh, moving forward. I think that is it. I'm happy to I'm happy to try and answer any uh questions or anything like that. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Let's see if we can get at least one of our we're going close on time, so let's see if we can get at least one of our questions answered. Um how far away is the maximal distance of the AIS patient to potentially have an improvement with IA slash IR? It, right now, the FDA improvement is eight hours. Um, I have treated patients longer than eight hours, um, although that determination, that's, a, that's an off-label use of uh, stroke devices. Um, it, is a, it is rare that that turns out to be uh, beneficial, uh, but it is the case, and, and there are certain circumstances where we do that. So, again, at this hospital, at our stroke system throughout the Methodist Hospital, we're activating uh, stroke workups all the way out to 12 hours. 
if the question is relating to to, to distance, that there's really, you know, it, it's it, it's all about time. It's all about getting the patients to us. So we've we've airlifted patients in with strokes from hundreds of miles away and, and done uh, interventions on them as well. Perfect. And we have one more question. I'll try. We'll try to get through it. But I know we're getting getting close on time. Is CT perfusion of value for IV TPA administration if IR and IA is unavailable due to tan- due to transportation time being very high? I don't think so. Again, again, we're working as a specialty to try and understand what the best way to use CT perfusion is. So right now, I would still have to consider that to be uh, investigational. Although it does seem to be adopting more and more uh, use. Um, throughout the throughout the country, um, but in terms of stratifying for IV TPA, I, I don't I don't see that as being a, a real option because if you have the opportunity, to, our our data on, on on IV TPA within three and four and a half hours for for select uh, patients is really really good, uh, and so if if you meet criteria, you should be giving IV TPA if if there's if 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 we can employ CT perfusion down the road, there's a possibility. But for right now, the best the best that you can do is is looking for um, anatomical lesions. So ordering a CT angiogram to try and identify if there's a large vessel occlusion. My guess is that CT perfusion. If you've got a patient that has a normal head CT, doesn't have large vessel occlusion, and you're wanting to use CT perfusion to try and tease out whether or not there's a clot there and you want to give IV TPA, that stroke territory is probably so small that my guess is that CT perfusion is not going to be particularly helpful. I don't think the spatial resolution is is going to be uh, good enough. And again, it's so technique and so operator dependent right now that that's going to vary a lot uh, from institution to institution. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Newman, for um, sharing your knowledge with us today. And thank you, everyone, who stayed on the line um, for our webinar and for joining us today. Um, This is the contact information for your American Heart Association quality and systems improvement um, field staff. Also, the link at the bottom is where we'll be posting um, all of our documents and our audio for today's webinar. We will also be offering a, a certificate of participation the certificate of patient of participation will actually be password coded, so you will have to watch the webinar and get to this slide in order to get the password. And the password is listed on here for you, so that will be uploaded to our website within one week. Also, we want to remind you to save the date for our next um, Stroke Essentials webinar. It's going to be April 29th from 12 noon to 1 p.m., and it's going to be covering Together to End Stroke Ideas for Stroke um, Community Education. And there's also a web link, so you can look at our Together to End Stroke information. Once again, thank everyone for joining us. Dr. Newman, thank you so much for your valuable time. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone. Have a great week.